Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Zhe. And I'm Bo Leung. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. 14 pan-democrat lawmakers to attend meeting with Beijing officials in Shenzhen this coming Sunday. Cafe Pacific Staff Union says planned strike in August still on books. Seven top FIFA officials arrested in Switzerland in growing sports scandal. So far, 14 pan-democrat politicians have said they will attend the meeting with Beijing officials in Shenzhen this coming Sunday. Civic Party lawmaker Alan Leung said they hope a separate meeting could be arranged just between the pan-democrats and the officials that day. The pan-democratic party members have decided that 14 of them will attend this Sunday's meeting across the border with Beijing officials for political reform talks. Civic Party lawmaker Alan Leung said they want to make a last-ditch effort to bring the message to the officials that Hong Kong people want real universal suffrage. Leung said it is the responsibility of the lawmakers to convey the wishes of Hong Kongers directly to the officials. Leung added the pan-democrats will also lobby for a two-hour meeting, separate from other participants, with the officials. We want to make every effort, even past the 11th hour, to uh, strive for real choice for Hong Kong people. This is something promised us by the basic law and has uh, been owing to us by the Central People's Government. So we want to go there and listen to the three uh, directors uh, through whom we hope the Central People's Government would speak in response to the clear an unequivocal message of Hong Kong people that we want real democracy. Two members of the Labour Party are also among the 14 who will be at the meeting. The Labour Party is determined to vote no against the uh, constitutional reform proposal that tabled by the SAR government. And we would like to meet the Beijing official face to face and tell them blankly that without a genuine democratic election, there is no way to improve the governance the, of uh, the Hong Kong SAR and there is no way to the repair the, uh, and uh, give any remedy for the, the splitting community. Earlier, Executive Council convener Lam Win Kwong called on the pan-democrats to build a sustained platform of dialogue with mainland officials. Speaking on a radio program, Lam said they should take a long-term view on the importance of the meeting this Sunday with Beijing officials in Shenzhen. Meanwhile, one of the organizers of the Occupy Central movement, Benny Tai, said a trusted middleman is needed to facilitate communication between the central government and the pan-democratic lawmakers. Is. Tai said the meeting between the officials and members is just a gathering of people and a middleman could be vital as a go-between to bring the messages of both sides together. The first day of talks between Cathay Pacific and the Flight Attendants Union has ended with at least one demand being resolved. The issue over legal protection for staff has been put back in the operations manual, but the union says it's still too early to say whether they will call off their planned industrial action in August. More details from Arthur Okiola. Dozens of flight attendants from Cathay Pacific were at Revenue Tower in Wan Chai this afternoon where the talks were taking place. They chanted slogans and waved placards to show their support. Respect Respect my union. The talks took place under the watchful eye of the Labor Department. The flight attendants union said despite agreeing to the meetings, it was still making preparations for the strike, which will not be called off until all their demands have been met. At the center of the dispute are the differences in salaries for old and new employees. The reduction of meal allowances for staff from $368 to $337 at the Melbourne Port of Call and the right to legal protection while on duty. But the issue on legal protection was resolved today. As I said, we have never intended to change our legal protection for our crew. So that's why today, because we have never changed our intention, it's quite easy for us to reach a kind of a consensus with the union and uh, by looking at the exact wordings that's acceptable by both parties. And this is what Tong had to say about the discrepancy in salary. The salary issue, uh, we talk about this and we have kind of explained our situation 
And we understand that there are some different viewpoints between the union and the company. And that's why we look forward to continue our discussion, especially on this point, uh, tomorrow. The head of the union said the talks were constructive, but were still in their early stages. Well, I would describe it as um, there was constructive exchange, yeah. But uh, whether if uh, there would be, uh, we will be able to consolidate any achievement, um, um, I, I believe it's too early to, to comment. But the city's labor chief said it was important that the discussions were being held. I think we, we must give them time and space to talk. The important starting point is it's managed to persuade both sides to get around the negotiating table. And it's a very important start because for any labor dispute, uh, misunderstanding can be ironed out through dialogue and communication, not confrontation. The union insists it is willing to negotiate for as long as possible, but it hopes management would show some sincerity. The two sides are expected to meet again on Thursday. Arthur Urquiola, ATV News. Lawmakers have accused the government of dragging its feet on the introduction of more competition to end Hong Kong's electricity duopoly. But Environment Secretary Wong Kam Singh says the government needs to keep an open mind on the issue. At present, electricity to Hong Kong consumers is supplied by two companies, Hong Kong Electric and China Light and Power. But the government is now looking to develop the city's electricity market as the scheme of control agreements with the two powerhouses, which basically sets the prices, ends in 2018. It is also seeking to cut the permitted rate of return of 9.99% as there has been criticism that the rate is too high. During a panel meeting on economic development, lawmakers grilled the government on whether it was seriously considering allowing more players into the market. Unionist legislator Tang Ka Piu asked if Environment Secretary Wang Kam Singh would cut the permitted rate of return to 6%, since the government does not appear to want to introduce any competition. Civic Party lawmaker Ronnie Tong also questioned what bargaining chips the government has in its negotiation process with the two power companies, or would Hong Kong consumers end up as pawns? Business and Professionals Alliance lawmaker Andrew Leung also criticized the government, saying it has been 20 years since they had vowed to introduce competition to the market, but there has been no progress or sign of it happening. Leung also urged the government to set up an independent monitoring body in the next one or two years to study how the market could be opened. But Wang said there are different tactics the government can rely upon in its discussions with the power companies, but he did not elaborate. Wang also said the government needs to keep an open mind when introducing new players to the market. The public consultation on the future development of the electricity market, which was launched in March, ends next month. MTR staff have demonstrated outside the railway's headquarters demanding an 8% pay hike. And the trial of ATV's management for failing to pay staff wages is set to begin in October. Arthur Okiola reports. ATV's executive director Ip Kapo is to stand trial in October for failing to pay employees wages from July last year to January this year. The court case is expected to last five days. Ip had earlier pleaded not guilty to 102 summonses worth more than $1 million. Dozens of demonstrators representing the MTRC's two staff unions gathered at the railway's headquarters in Sha Tin today. They're demanding an 8% pay rise. They argue the increased passenger numbers haven't been reflected in their salaries. The demonstrators also insist the 8% is a reasonable increase to help them cope with inflation. A study by the Chinese University has found that smokers cost taxpayers more than $11 billion each year in healthcare expenses and productivity-related losses. This is more than double the findings of a similar study carried out less than two decades ago. But the researchers say they are actually low-balling this estimate, as medical costs for affected non-smokers aren't factored in. We did not actually include any second-hand smoker. We did not actually include any um, uh, direct uh, medical cost inflation. Could be drug 
cause inflation, could be the uh, disease management inflation. So this is actually a rough estimation based on totally uh, uh, flat inflation rate. The study also found smokers spend $20,000 on average per year on their habit if they smoke one pack a day, and the whopping $1.14 million on tobacco products alone in their lifetime. Arthur Urquiola, ATV News. The U.S. has expressed concern about China's maritime plans after the official opening of two lighthouses in disputed waters. A White House spokesman said President Barack Obama believes security in the South China Sea is important. Josh Ernest accused China of taking an increasingly assertive posture with its land reclamation on a reef in the Spratly Islands. The complaint came the day after Beijing unveiled its latest defense report, which recommended boosting air and sea defenses due to increasing threats in the region. Australia is threatening to punish the family of an Australian who volunteered to fight for Islamic State. And the U.S. has accused Iraqi soldiers of lacking the will to fight Islamic State militants trying to take over their country. Ben O'Rourke reports. The White House has backed Defence Secretary Ash Carter's comments at the weekend that Iraqi forces are showing no will to fight against Islamic State or ISIL after the militant group took over Ramadi last week. I, I think there are a variety of contributors to what happened in Ramadi. Uh, the first is that there, the Iraqi security forces who are fighting in Ramadi and have been fighting in Ramadi for a year and a half didn't have the benefit of the training of the United States and our coalition uh, partners. Uh, there uh, were clearly, as the Iraqis have indicated, uh, some military command and planning problems that occurred. Uh, and we saw a pretty effective tactic uh, used by ISIL. And all of that led to a, a not uh, unsubstantial setback uh, in Ramadi. But, 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 but what the defense secretary said was the Iraqi forces just showed no will to fight. So. Does the White House agree with that assessment from the Defense Secretary? The Iraqi forces just showed no will to fight. Well, th that certainly has been a problem that we've seen in the past. U.S. President Barack Obama said he understands Iraq needs help to fight the militants and that it is a job for NATO. Uh, and we are working closely with NATO allies to make sure that we are partnering with other countries uh, to address issues of counterterrorism, making sure that uh, uh, we continue to coordinate effectively in the fight against ISIL because all 28 NATO members are members of the coalition uh, to support the Iraqi government against uh, the ISIL fight. Video posted on the internet overnight is said to show the Syrian Air Force bombing Islamic State targets around Homs province. According to U.S. Defense Department documents obtained recently by public interest group Judicial Watch, the U.S. and its allies deliberately aligned themselves with al-Qaeda and other extremist groups in an attempt to topple the Syrian government. The 2012 report predicts the rise of Islamic State and that Western governments would continue to support it, including creating safe havens for the militant group in Iraq. It also contradicts the Obama administration's official story about the group's rise to power. Meanwhile, in Australia, the government has threatened the wife and children of an Australian man who left the country to fight for Islamic State with the full severity of Australian law if they return home. Well, the point I make is that crime is crime is crime, uh, and criminals will face the full severity of Australian law. Whether they're male or female, uh, uh, criminals will face the full severity of Australian law and it is a crime, a very serious crime uh, under Australian law uh, for people to go abroad and uh, fight or assist terrorist organisations. Abbott was responding to a newspaper report that the wife and children of a wanted militant fighting in Syria are seeking repatriation. The family members may get stripped of their citizenship. Ben O'Rourke, ATV News. Turning to sports news, seven top FIFA officials have been arrested in Switzerland in connection with a corruption investigation by authorities in the U.S. A probe into the 2018 and 2022 World Cup bids has also been launched. Authorities in Zurich launched an early morning operation to arrest the FIFA officials on alleged corruption charges, which include money laundering, bribery and wire fraud spanning over two decades. 
Around 100 million US dollars of bribes are said to be involved. More than a dozen Swiss plainclothed officers arrived unannounced at a luxury hotel to make the arrests and extradite them to the US. FIFA Vice President Jeffrey Webb was among those detained. A spokesperson for FIFA said President Sepp Blatter was not involved. According to media reports, up to 14 people have been arrested worldwide as part of an ongoing operation. The scandal comes at a time when football officials are in the Swiss city for an annual meeting where Blatter is seeking a fifth term. The election for the top job will go ahead on Friday. The arrest once again throws FIFA's credibility under the spotlight as Swiss prosecutors launch a criminal investigation into the 2018 and 2022 World Cup bids. Last year, the governing body was accused of wrongdoing over the bidding process for Russia's 2018 World Cup and the 2022 edition in Qatar. An independent investigator looked into the allegations and the football governing body's ethics committee ruled that any breaches were only of very limited scope and closed its investigations. Despite the probe, FIFA said the two tournaments will still be played in Russia and Qatar.